And now, Coast to Coast Rhea presents The Experts Corner with Pete Asmus. Now get ready to go make something happen because in this series, it's all about actionable information with different experts, strategies, and solutions from around the country. You won't be able to help but catapult your life into a new direction. So get ready because we are going to begin. And now from coast to coast, your host, Pete there we go. We've got uh, today, tonight, we are talking to Clint uh, Coons, who is our resident attorney um, when it comes to all things uh, keeping yourself safe and, and legal, and when it comes to really um, ensuring that you keep the money that you, that you make, because at the end of the day, that's really what we're, we're looking to do. So I wanted to do a webinar with Clint. We did one already. Um, and that one was off the chain. It was awesome, man. I haven't had anybody um, like light up our boards like they did after yours um, <laughs> talking about the self-directed IRA. So if you guys missed that one, go to c2crea.com and in the search bar, just uh, type in Clint Coons, C-L-I-N-T uh, space C-O-O-N-S. And then you'll see all the different places that he pops on our website and look for the one um, where we did the experts corner uh, with him. So we decided to do another Experts Corner tonight. Um, and tonight we wanted to talk about trusts, what the different types of trusts are. And if you listen to today's uh, radio show, you're going to have a little bit of a, an inkling of what's coming. And the fact that, you know, I mean, I learned something today during the show that I never, and, and you know, I think learning sometimes is, we, we take it for granted what I mean by that. Meaning when Clint worded it in a way that I hadn't heard it before, it made it click for me. It made more sense. I always thought trusts were all different, right? You had a family trust, you had a living trust, you had this trust, you have that trust. And it's like, okay, well, what, what does this one do? And what does that one do? And when he was like, look, they're all the same. It's just, they just have different parts to them. It's, it's like, I, all of a sudden it clicked. I understood. It's like, okay, they're, they're all like a car, right? A car is going to get you from point A to point B. It's, they, all of them have four wheels. They have doors, all that stuff, a steering wheel. They have, they've got windshield wipers and all that. But some of them have electric windows. Some of them have a hatchback. Some of them are a truck instead of a car. And so when he when he explained it like that to me, all of a sudden it clicked. It was like, okay, I get it now. Now now it's it's really trust do one thing. And and the different types of trust basically um, have different uh, add-ons to them, have different uh, the, the, the extra parts on them. And so we're going to be going into that tonight. And I'm going to let Clint kind of go off and do his thing. And, and Ivan's actually on this call as well. Um, I think we even got Scott on. I don't, man, it feels like everybody's on this call, which is pretty awesome because we've got, uh, what, like 25 people right now. So what I want to do is I'm going to turn it over to Clint. I want Clint to go ahead and, and just introduce himself real quick, um, who he is. And then we're going to start getting into this. And I'm going to let him go through uh, what he's talking about. And you'll hear me kind of chime in or, or you'll hear Ivan chime in every once in a while and ask a question. And maybe we'll dig down into a rabbit hole with him. And then we'll come back up. If you guys have any questions, I want to go ahead and let you know right over there to the right side, you're going to see webinars. On that little drop-down menu, you can ask any question you want. Clint can't see it, but I can. So as he's talking, if you guys have a question, I will look through them, and um, I will interject and ask your questions for you as well. We will also open this up at the end for a uh, Q&A part where you guys can actually raise your hand and ask questions uh, live, whatever questions you want. Now on the radio, I told you guys, be on this call and be prepared to ask things. Clint is extremely smart at what he does. He's very good. Why would you not want to use this time to pick his brain? So that's what we're about tonight. One, one hour, 90 minutes, we're going to be coming at you. It's going to be all content. We're recording everything. So that way we can get this. Uh, quit lying. Yeah, okay. Ivan's not cool. I'm, I'm the only one that's really cool. I, I can't. Uh, this is such a big screen. Now I can't even see like what is being said way over there on the thing. So uh, with that, I want to go ahead and turn this over to uh, Clint and uh, tell him welcome. Look at that, man. What an applause. What a welcome. Hey, thanks for having me on. So you want me to introduce a little bit about myself? I'll just tell you a little bit about Anderson. Uh, 
You know, we, I have a law firm. It's got uh, two offices, one in Washington State and one in Nevada, and we work with investors all throughout the United States. You know, just the other day I was looking at putting together a new map of all of our clients, where they're located. We're not going to disclose their names or anything, but it was just my web guy told me, he said, Clint, we cannot put all of your clients on the United States map because there would just be too many to show, so we're going to have to cut it down. Uh, we have quite a few clients throughout the U.S., and, and the reason that is is because our firm understands what real estate investors are doing. I mean, you can go to your local attorney, and they're going to talk to you about LLCs or corporations, but they really don't understand how these things apply to the real estate investor. I mean, tonight's topic is case in point. We're talking about land trust, and I would venture to guess that two out of ten attorneys know about land trust. The rest are clueless. They think maybe you're setting up a trust for a conservation easement. And so it's finding the right type of advice under, we're from experts who actually understand what it is you're doing that has propelled our firm to probably the forefront of asset protection throughout the country when it comes to this particular topic, protecting real estate investors. And that also goes hand in hand. You know, we also have a tax practice built into our firm and I created this because I saw the other problem that real estate investors face and that is you know you get the asset protection component and then your CPA punts he's like well I'm not going to talk to you about taxes you got to go talk to a CPA about taxes I don't feel I'm qualified well I can tell you you know when it comes to investing and structuring somebody you have to have both sides together on the same sheet of music otherwise you're going to create plan plans that are they're not in harmony with one another. And if you get audited, you're going to find out that you weren't doing things right on the asset protection side. Now you lost some tax benefits. So we have a full-blown tax practice inside of our firm. And we also have a retirement planning section, which you know, that was on our previous webinar that we talked about on what is the appropriate way to structure your investments through a qualified retirement plan versus an IRA, uh, especially for real estate investing, some of the challenges people face. Uh, on that particular topic. In fact, I was just talking to one of my clients today who is uh, who has listened to that webinar and is getting out of his self-directed IRA because he couldn't sell his property to an individual buyer because they couldn't get financing because the bank kept asking him, hey, we need to see the rent rolls. We want to see your tax returns for the last three years. Actually, it was two years. Uh, in order for us to give this individual a loan because the person who was buying his house is an investor and they were going to use the rent rolls as a way to qualify for the loan and the bank kept asking to see my client's Schedule E. Well, it's held inside of an IRA. They don't file tax returns. He could not provide them anything and he's gone through three different lenders and they haven't been able to close that transaction yet. So, uh, you know, I helped him out there. We gave him a, a way around it. And hopefully he's going to put that together in the next couple of weeks or so. I got to tell just, you that, that, yeah. That um that uh, webinar that we did a few weeks ago, it was awesome. You guys, if you haven't heard it again, I'm gonna just I'm gonna implore you one more time to go and check that out because I what I learned on that more than anything was was information I've never even heard before. I mean, especially when you're talking about why the 401k was so much better and, and had so much more diversity than the self-directed IRA, because that's all I've ever heard people say. Self-directed, 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 self-directed. Self I mean, everywhere. Even when I was, I was working for Robert Allen, I was working for Armando, I was working for the guys from Flipping Boston, I was working for, you know, people up in, in, in Canada. It was always self-directed. I have never heard anybody tell me anything about a 401k and so when or I'm sorry a solo 401 and so when you when you brought that out and why it was so great man it was like it got me hyped I mean it got Ivan hyped he was like all right we got to be able to start this we got to start this now man I mean it, it's so I'm just again man I I really appreciate your time with that that webinar I thought it was awesome you know it, it this is what I'm talking about here is how I relate to real estate investors is that you know, the things that I talk about are, if they're not what I'm doing, I have clients that are doing them, and I see the problems they're facing. And so many times I hear people teach these strategies or tell people to go out and do X or Y or Z. And I'm looking at it going, they haven't done that yet. They don't even know what they're facing. They may be telling people to do it, but it doesn't work that way anymore. And so you have to make sure that the structures that you're implementing are relevant to today's investing environment. And the only way you're going to do that is either you're out there in the trenches like you two are or you have clients that are out there in the trenches and you're working with them helping put these deals together. And so tonight, you know, I really want to talk about land trust because it's, it's such a confusing topic for so many different people. 
on how these trusts actually work. I probably get at least five to ten emails a week from individuals who have come across your site, come across my blog, that are just confused when it comes to this particular topic because they go to their attorney and they mention the term, I heard, you know, land trust. I heard about this great investing tool and immediately the attorney, if he's not up on it, he's down on it. He tells them, you don't know what you're talking about. There's no such thing. You can't use that. It's, it's not going to provide protection for you or it's going to create problems with the IRS. And the, what it really comes down to at the end of the day is that unless you live in one of these states that I have up here, uh, states that have actually adopted land trust via statute, that is where they've carved out a statute, and they say we now formally recognize them under state law. We're not going to rely upon case law what does that to mean? interpret these. What does that mean? Well, one is where you have judges make law, which they do all the time, but uh, you, one is where you actually have the legislators sit down and say, all right, now we're going to formally recognize this. We no longer have to rely upon judges and their interpretations of the common law. You know, that body of work that came over on the Mayflower and yes. formed our entire legal system. So even if it's common law or if it's statute, I mean, really, when you look at the cases, they're pretty consistent in how land trusts are used. Because at the end of the day, it's just a, it's just a grant or trust is, is all we're dealing with here. Now, in, uh, what, when you're saying this about these these states, do you mean that in these states um, they have actually had uh, cases go to court and then they had a verdict in that case, and that therefore that added validity to these states upholding the the um, trust? Is that what you're yeah, saying? Absolutely correct. Okay. I'll give an example. California doesn't yes. have a land trust. I just dealt with an attorney two weeks ago on this. So I had recommended to my client to create a land trust. He went to his local attorney and he said they're not recognized in California. Well, the problem is, is that the attorney, when you're presented with that question, he was never taught it in law school. He doesn't see a statute about it. He's not going to spend the time to research case law to see if this is actually recognized in the state of California. So he's going to give you a quick answer because you're not paying him to research it. If you went to him and said, listen, can you research the validity of land trust and here's $5,000? He would probably get you an answer. But if you're not willing to do that, you're going to get the standard answer that my, this individual received. It's not my client. So in response to that email, I sent him back two cases. And I said, you know, I understand your attorney's busy, but why don't you have him research these two cases where California actually recognized a land trust. They actually recognized the Illinois style land trust by case law in 1992 and the previous one I think was in 1965 where this was actually came and was presented in front of the court on how these things should be interpreted. And so from that you then gather that yes they are recognized by statute and they will be interpreted in a certain way. And that, Not, that's important by statute, because I mean by case law. we want to know what's going to happen should something bad happen, right? And so when we've had case law, when we've had cases before that have been tried and have verdicts on them, now we have something to fall back and lean on. It's not just hearsay or or what could happen because there are certain states where this hasn't been brought to light, right? And so it could literally go either way. I've got cases in all 50 states. It's called precedent. I mean, one of the things that we do before we recommend a client set one of these things up is make sure there's case law behind it. It's going to be recognized as a trust in the way in which I'm about to describe it. Got it. Because otherwise it's crazy to do it. You're just making stuff up at that point, right? I mean, you're just yeah, like I mean, grabbing a pencil you, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Sounds like a radio show I was on earlier today. It's, it's weird, uh, right? <laughs> yeah. I'll let you go. Right. I'll, I'll stop. All right. So what, I mean, so you got this trust and, you know, why would a real estate investor even want to consider one of these things? Because, you know, at the end of the day, um, it's just a grant toward trust and it doesn't provide any type of protection. But the reason why people do it, set one of these trusts up, is because they want protection from due on sale clauses. And what I mean by that is that, you know, if you have a piece of real estate, it's encumbered by a mortgage and you transfer it into an LLC, which was commonly done probably five, six, and even more uh, years ago. Uh, somebody bought a piece of property. Yeah, it was encumbered. They would go what out and get mean? a loan on it. Uh, it means it has a loan and they filed a deed, the bank filed a deed of trust, the lender or filed a mortgage against the property to secure their interest. Okay, so, so just one more time real slow, just for people that don't maybe don't know some of these bigger terms, just so what, just if you can just explain it again one more time in, in layman's terms. Okay, so if somebody came to me and they said, Clint, 
I would like to borrow $100,000 from you. Now, I'm going to say, sure, I will give you the $100,000, but I need collateral. I need something to back up that money. So if you don't pay me, I have some asset, some hard asset that I can go and collect against, and that is sell so I can get my money back. Got it. If you're buying real estate, typically people are going to offer up the real estate as collateral for the loan. Okay. And in order to protect my interest, I have to file something against that real estate to let the world know, hey, if he tries to sell it to you, you have to pay me off because I have a valid lien against that property. So that's what we mean by encumbering. We prevent people from being able to transfer clear title Got without it. paying off the underlying debt. And if any of you guys have any other questions, we can go into that further, but they also call it clouding the title or, well, I mean, that, that's another form yeah, of, that's a of, different term. Yeah. Different term. Never mind. Yeah. All right. So why do you do it then? Because if you put it in the LLC and the lender finds out about it, they can accelerate your note, which means that they can tell you to pay it off. Now, many real estate investors, they want to transfer title into an entity for asset protection, which we did. Uh, like I said, in the, in the mid 2000s, when real estate was hot, people were transferring um, property into LLCs left and right. Now, what has occurred as a result of the mortgage meltdown is that lenders now are scrutinizing loans. They're not actually the lenders that are doing the scrutiny, that are uh, bringing in the scrutiny. It's the people who insure it, the companies that insure the mortgages. They want to know what the lenders are up to because they don't want to get caught with their pants down again and having to pay out tons of money because of all these bad mortgages. So they'll come in and they'll do a spot check. Or if you're trying to, if the bank's trying to sell your mortgage, the person who's buying it will spot check it. And what they'll do is they'll look at it and say, all right, this person borrowed the money. Who's on title? Well, if the person who borrowed it is no longer on title, that's a problem for them. And so in those situations where it is caught, they will go back to the borrower and say, we have a problem here. Either you pay off the mortgage or we can foreclose. We have that right, and then we can come after you for the personal guarantee that you signed. Some of them will make you refinance. And if you look at where we're at right now, mortgage rates are going up. They're not going down. So if I'm a lender and I'm in a position where I know I can make more money off my portfolio, wouldn't it behoove me to hire an intern and say, just start going through these mortgages, make sure that the borrower is still on title, because if he's not and he's transferred title, let's go force him to refi the property at a much higher interest rate. And so you have to be particularly concerned about wow. this, and the way you get around it is through a land trust. And there's a key to that. The question is why? Can you avoid that? Well, it has to do with the Garn St. Germain Depository Institutions Act, blah, 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 of 1982, which basically came from rising interest rates. If you, if, I don't know how many people are old enough to remember uh, what happened in the 70s and early 80s is that we had runaway inflation. And until um, Reagan came into power and changed how inflation was calculated to bring it from 16% back down to a reasonable 8% at the time, um, what people were experiencing is that lenders would come in and force people to refinance out of their 4% mortgage into a 14% mortgage oh. because they had transferred titled into a living trust for estate planning purposes. And just like Congress has been with the Dodd-Frank Act, they're always slow to the party to react, and then when they get there, they overreact in many situations. Well, in this case, I don't think they necessarily overreacted, but they were slow to getting here. And finally, when they did decide to do something, as a result of people having their mortgages or forced to refinance from lower uh, interest rate mortgages to higher interest rate mortgages, just because they were setting up in a trust, they said, you can no longer do that. If you're a lender and it's a federally backed loan and you and, a, and the borrower puts it into a grantor trust, which is what a land trust is, doesn't offer any asset protection, um, then in that case, you can't accelerate the note on them. And so with a land trust, what we're concerned about is it has to be residential real estate. That has to be four units or less, and you can rely upon the Garn St. Germain Act to protect you. Now, in my experience, okay, I haven't seen a lot of lenders call notes due even when they're in LLCs. I mean, the threat's always there, but I haven't seen it happen all that much. I would say probably the people that I've dealt with, maybe 5 to 10% have ever experienced this problem. But the issue is, are you in a situation where you could 
handle it or adequately manage that type of risk. If you were forced to refinance your properties or if they put you in the situation where maybe you had 12 loans, you can't get out the loans anymore for these properties, so you'd have to let them go. So it's just not something that, that you want to risk. And by putting your property into a, a land trust, you trump the lender. What they do is they look at it, they figure it's done for estate planning purposes, and they don't even come knocking. I've yet to have a client call me up and tell me that the lender called them and asked to see information about their transfers into trust. It just doesn't happen. So that's one reason why we do it, for acceleration protection, uh, to prevent the lender from calling your note due. Now, another reason why people put them in the land trust is strictly for privacy. See, the thing about a trust is that you can hide your ownership in your property through the use of what we call a nominee trustee. So the way you set up a land trust is you, you draft this document, it's a contract, and you state on there, you come up with any name you want. So I typically use a property address uh, for my trust. It used to be that when I would set up my entities for my real estate, I would just come up with some obscure name, the Red Frog Trust, Blue Frog Trust. And then when you have to go back and think about it and people ask you, well, which property is actually in that Red Frog Trust? I don't remember. So I realized that it's better to use the property address so you can associate the trust to the property. Now, when you transfer title into a trust, what you're actually doing is you're putting it also in the name of a trustee. So it would be, for instance, Clint Coons, trustee of the Red Frog Trust, dated March 1st, 2014. Well, the problem with that is that I'm not, I'm not gaining any anonymity. If somebody wanted to pull title, they would see that Clint was the owner of the property initially, and then he transferred it over into a trust, and he's still listed uh, on that trust as a trustee. So they know I'm still associated with this particular parcel of real estate. A better way is to utilize a nominee trustee, and that is someone that will be listed on your trust so, so that your information is kept private. So let me back up a minute here and tell you about the land trust. So when you transfer title into a trust, you have the grantor, which is a person who transferred the title in, who owns the property. You have the trustee who holds title to the property for the benefit of the beneficiaries. The beneficiaries are the people who actually own the property through this trust vehicle. Now, as the beneficiaries, you have all the rights to the rents that come off the properties. You have the right to, to tell the trustee to sell the property. You have all the control. Your trustee really has no control over your trust. I mean, we're giving him some nominal powers, but he couldn't sell it. He couldn't mortgage it uh, out from underneath you because all that power rests with the beneficiaries. You can always fire your trustee if he doesn't listen to you. So when you set up a land trust, you always want to be the beneficiary because you want to have all this control. And the nice thing about the beneficial, being a beneficiary is that you can transfer your ownership, as we'll just uh, explain in a little bit, to someone else. And that doesn't get recorded. So the only thing that gets recorded is the tr transfer from the original owner of the property into the name of the trust. That's the only thing you see on title. And so if I wanted to provide anonymity for myself, I'll do what I did just recently for a client in California. So here's an individual. And he has a fair amount of money, and he doesn't want any of the people who know him or know of him to, to know that he bought this, this real estate in California. So he called me up and he said, Clint, we need to create a vehicle that can hold title to the property without letting everyone in the world know that I own this particular piece of property. Simple. So what we'll do is we're going to create a trust. I'm going to be your initial trustee of your trust. So we're going to take title. It's going to say Clint Coons, trustee of the Ever Beautiful Trust dated April 1st, 2014. Now, that's how we took title to this property. It was not only did we pay cash, it was also financed. And when it closed, it was in my name as trustee. Now, after we closed on the property, I then resigned my position as trustee of this trust. So I backed off the trust and I turned it over to my client. That information does not get recorded when I resign my position because a land trust is a private document. You don't file it with the state. It doesn't get recorded anywhere. The only thing that gets recorded is the deed transferring the property into the trust. So I resign my position. Now, if anybody pulls up the address to this particular piece of real estate in California, what they would find is that it's held in a trust with Clint Coons as trustee. And I'm not even the trustee anymore, but they don't know that. It's actually my client who's the trustee of this particular trust because I've resigned my position. And by the way, if you're, on, if you're thinking, well, what happens if your trustee doesn't resign? Well, you have the, uh, the ability to fire him. You can kick him off. So 
however you do it, you, you've got complete control over this trust at all times as a beneficiary. But keep in mind, you need to be concerned here who you choose as a nominee trustee. Uh, I've had some people use their, their good friends and other real estate investors or nominee trustee, and this guy, for whatever reason, decided to quit paying his taxes. This was in New York, and New York came down on him, and when they filed a lien against his real estate, all they did is search every county where this individual's name appeared on title, and it just so happens that he appeared as the trustee of this my client's trust, and all those properties got liened for his taxes. So that's an issue, and that's why you want to use attorney or uh, somebody that's a professional to ensure that that doesn't happen to you. And I also put on here, some states do not require the trustee's name on title. You, you can get creative as well. I wouldn't try to do that on your own, but you can transfer title into a trust just using the trust name. You don't disclose the trustee in the title, but you put it on the deed where he signs, and that can provide another uh, level of anonymity as well. So privacy is huge. Uh, another reason why people should use land trust, title concerns, prevents churning of title. You know, one of the issues that uh, banks are faced with now is that in the run-up to the mortgage meltdown, you had investors buying and selling property, buying and selling property. You may have, you know, three flips within a year period, and then it ultimately a homeowner would purchase the property from the third investor. And the bank would actually loan on this inflated value because they'd look back and they'd say, hey, look at the property sold for this, and then it sold for this, and then it sold for this, so it's definitely worth $800,000. Then the bottom fell out and they found out the property was truly only worth about $500,000. So the problem you face is if you are an individual who is going to buy property and then sell it to an investor who is then in turn going to rehab it and sell it to a individual homeowner, what you should consider is why not set up this transaction so that my investor purchaser can buy the title, can buy the property without fear that his ultimate end buyer won't run into any problems with obtaining financing. And the way you do that is you take title initially in the name of the trust, and then you sell the trust to the actual um, investor. So the investor buys your trust, that doesn't get recorded anywhere. So the only thing that ever shows up on title is that this trust purchased the property. What you don't see is the fact that the trust has been transferred to an investor. So investor then, he owns the property through the trust, he can rehab it, do all of his work, and then eventually find a buyer who's going to obtain financing to buy that property. And on the chain of title, what you'll find is there's only been one transfer within a 60-day or 120-day period, and that was from the original seller. So it protects title. That is, it keeps subsequent transfers in between the initial purchase and the ultimate purchase by the end homeowner by uh, showing up because it is the trust that gets transferred along, not the actual property. And the way I explained it earlier today on the show is to think of it as a box. You put your property into a box, and then the box is the one that owns the house. And so what you're doing is you're not transferring property more. All you're doing is transferring the box along to other individuals. And they, since they have the box, have the right to get whatever is inside of that box. And it just so happens that it's a piece of property. So title concerns is a great reason why we would use land trust. Another one is ease of transferability. That kind of goes hand in hand with what I just talked about with title concerns. With the land trust, it makes it really simple to transfer property around without anyone finding out about it. So when you record the property in the name of the trust, the trust itself, as I stated, does not get recorded anywhere. So if you want to move that trust over to uh, another person or another entity, all you have to do is assign it. That is, you sign a piece of paper saying, I hereby assign my interest in this trust to you, and then that person becomes the owner of that box. Now, this is really uh, great for real estate investors. Uh, let me show you this right here. If you can see it. So let's assume that I have uh, an LLC right here, this box, and I have a couple of properties in it like this. And I did this initially, I set up multiple properties in this one LLC because the equity overall wasn't that great. So I had three properties inside of there. This is LLC number one. Now we're three years down the road and the equity inside of this one LLC here is too much. And I want to spread my overall risk between two LLCs. So the question is, how do you get this property here over to here without alerting anybody to the fact that the property has actually been transferred to another entity? Well, 
you can't. What you would have to do is deed the property out to yourself, and then you yourself would have to deed the property into this LLC. And depending on the state in which you live, sometimes what they'll do is they'll hit you with a transfer tax uh, in pulling that property out. So that becomes a real problem for real estate investors. But if you have these properties inside of land trusts like this, all you need to do is assign the piece of paper to yourself from your LLC and then reassign it over here to LLC number two. And now the property has been moved from LLC number one to LLC number two. And nobody is aware of that transfer. The only person that knows that is you. So it, it simplifies transfers between entities. And that's, and that's why I really like the use of this trust for real estate investors. Because it's private. Nobody knows about it when you uh, engage in this type of transaction. Now, your, your art training, did you, did, is that the same law school slash art school? Hey, man, I'm doing the best I can. No, with because this I was just saying, because tablet. that's awesome. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, all right. I was going to draw you, but I guess it doesn't want <laughs> draw me to. You. <laughs> no, you know what? I I want to I want to go back and I you may cover this. I have two things that I wanted to talk about, but I'll, I'll just I'll ask one of them right now. Um mm -hmm. you were talking about the trust and and moving back and forth. So so I'll ask this. If we put a trust, could we put a trust into an IRA or a self-directed IRA? Um and would you be able to get the profit? Because one of the problems with an IRA is that you can't take any profits out, right? And so mm -hmm. if we put it into the trust, would we? Would there be a way for us to do that? And, and does that make sense what I just said? Yeah, you want to know if you could put it into a trust and then pull profit out of it, right? Correct. Well, then you'd have one of these. See, that's a sign you'd be holding up. <laughs> we'll work there'd for be food. little numbers against it. <laughs> numbers against Yeah. Okay, so be no. This big guy over here. Yeah, just he's waiting be... for you to be his cellmate. <laughs> oh my god, this is so inappropriate, but it's right? funny. Okay, yeah. second question. Um, Bottom bunk or top bunk? If if we if <laughs> if we have a trust and we wanted to, if we weren't going to be wholesaling it, right? Um, or I'm sorry, the interest rates. Going back to your interest rates, if we know right now, say the interest rate is at five percent and the interest rates are only going up and I have a house and now I want to sell it, but I don't necessarily need the money. Would a trust be a way for me to basically be a bank and then sell the property through the trust and assign them the, the beneficial interest, but only based on the fact that they're, I'm, I'm holding the note within that trust. Does that make sense? And then, and then if they, if they, let's say they pay off a hundred thousand of this loan and, and two years they're ready to move again and, and they don't have, you know, Obviously, they need to find somebody to buy it. And so I could go, hey, look, I will continue to be the bank for you. I will loan now it's 9% instead of 8%. But if you can find me somebody that can give you, let's say they made 100, if they could put 100 grand down so that you get to take that and I will continue being the bank at 8% now. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Because that to me seems like an, an, an amazing way with interest rates going up. A trust is a great way to build a bank, basically. Well, there's a word for that. It's called wraparound mortgage. Oh, I thought you were going to say me going to jail again. So I'm so no. glad that that didn't become part of that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you can actually do that. It's called selling the product. Well, you're, you're talking about a wrap. Most of the, uh, the time, what people are doing is they're actually finding a distressed homeowner or an individual who just wants out of the property and they're taking the property subject to the existing financing. So they'll go up to the homeowner and they'll explain to them, they'll say, listen, I want to buy your property from you and I'll start making the payments because I'm going to rehab it and then I'm going to flip it to somebody else who's going to buy it. But the problem I have is that it's encumbered by a mortgage, and I can't pay that mortgage off right now. I don't want to get financing because my, I, I'm already extended on my credit for the other properties I own. So here's what we'll do. I'm going to you know, pay X, Y, and Z to you. You're going to assign the property or deed it over to a trust now that I own and control. So from the bank's perspective, all they're going to see is that you transfer title into the trust. They're not going to know that you sold the property to me. They won't accelerate the note. Now I hold title to this trust, which in turn holds title to the property, I'm going to do my work and then I'm going to sell it to someone else, you know, another purchaser. And so when that property gets sold, what happens is escrow is going to pick up, there's an underlying mortgage with uh, B of A, so that mortgage gets paid off. So the first seller is happy because they're no longer liable on that note. And then you make some uh, profit off the deal as well because the remaining portions paid to the trust, 
uh, off the sale of that property and then you take it out as a beneficiary. So it was commonly used for those types of transactions and it was used quite successfully by a lot of investors. And the reason why I use somewhat of a past tense in that is because it was also abused. And um, a lot, you know, some people did face some issues with the way they negotiated their transactions as they were somewhat misleading. And so I often tell people, if you want to structure a deal like that where you're going to use subject to deal uh, property and it's not yours to begin with, like you described in a typical wrap transaction, right. then I would make sure that the seller has their own independent legal counsel that has reviewed the transaction signs off on it. So they can't later come back against you and say, you know, I was talking to this guy, Pete, and he's a really scatterbrain, all over the place, oh. slick talker. Man. And I couldn't follow him, but it all sounded really good. So I gave him my house <laughs> and I want it back because he stole my equity. Okay. But, I gotcha. Yeah. Now, yeah, what man, about what if it's my say. house? What about, can you please take me and Bubba off of there? The guy with the bugged out eyes. I don't know why my eyes are closed and I'm crying why the guy right behind me has got these humongous eyes and he's like going, all Dude, right, here we go. If you have to ask, you don't that, want that, to go okay, to prison. Okay, yeah, all right. So so then, <laughs> oh, what was I talking about now? We we were, um, the, the, the wraparound loan. So what about if it's my loan? So I borrowed the money from the bank. I got a great 3%, 4%, 5% loan right now. Um, it's two years from now. I want to sell. It's my loan. I put it into a trust. Can I now control the beneficiary through that and and allow somebody else to buy it through the trust where, whereby I'm still holding my trust and basically holding the mortgage within it, creating almost like a bank. Does that yeah, make sense? You what do that. Yeah, yeah. You want to do a wrap, but you don't want the bank to know you've done a wrap on that property. Um, you know, another way to handle that same transaction is to probably use a land contract, which would make it a little simpler for people. But in essence, yes, you could do that. So if somebody came to me and they wanted to, I wanted to sell them my house, but I didn't want the lender to know that I'd sold them the property, what I would do is put it in the land trust and then sell them the beneficial interest of the trust. And that way I get to keep I get to keep that spread, whatever it is. And if in two years they want to sell and they've made 20 grand and they bring a buyer in and I go, great, get me a buyer with 20 grand down and I will go ahead and, and I'll hold the note again. Like I'm okay with that. I could now go up to whatever interest rate is, is standard all while I have that low 5% that I've got locked in for the next 30 years, right? Correct. But you're going to have to file a second on the property as well to secure your interest. Okay. Explain that again. Well, you're going to want to make sure that if you say you bought you owe on the property $150,000 and you sell it for $500,000, I would make sure that you put a 350 second on the property because the initial lender is going to have a first. Because if you don't have a secured interest on that property when you sell it to somebody else, then what they can do is turn around and flip it and sell it to a third party for whatever they paid you or bought it from you for. And they'll get the 350. The first lender will get the 150, and you'll be left holding the bag. Going, how do I get my money back? You have to sue them individually. So remember what we talked about: encumbering the property to yep. secure your interest. You missed that step. You want to make sure that you've encumbered it. So, so what you're saying is, I can also write my own mortgage. I can create a note against my um, my property. And is that something that? And I know the answer to this, but again, there's there's people that are that are tuning in that may have you know never done any real estate, and I want to make sure that we're we're making all of this make sense to them as well. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. You can file a deed of trust against your own property. I mean, what, uh, a, a nifty little strategy that I use for individuals who have 100% uh, equity in their property; it's fully unencumbered. Mm -hmm. If we want to provide a smoke screen, we'll set up an LLC in Nevada or some other state that offers anonymity for the entity so people can't trace it back to my client and then we'll enter into a, a relationship for a line of credit and in exchange for that line of credit we'll take back a deed of trust against their real estate so it'll be pledged as collateral for the line of credit so then the property is now encumbered by the promissory note that my client signed with his own entity so it appears that the property is fully encumbered and it discourages litigation. That's all. Man, I love this stuff, man. I really do. I, I mean, I love it when you know it and stuff. Not not, not like I don't want to go learn it all. But I love it that you know it and, and that Ivan and Scott and, and having super smart people around me that can help me. I mean, that's 
that's the key. Uh, you know, having somebody like, and, and here's the other thing, man, guys, realize that what, what, um, what Clint's telling you is true. This is not taught in law school. So the only way that you get to really know this is to dig down deep and learn it. And Clint wanted to learn it. He wanted to learn it because he saw it as a vehicle. So understand that this is something that is amazing. You guys make sure you guys are writing down your questions that you guys might have because we're going to be getting into that part later on. All right, keep going, my man. All right, so if you want to wholesale property, so here's an issue people run into, especially if they're dealing with HUD. Um, if you're taking, you're securing the property under contract, and let's assume that you're able to negotiate 90 days or 120 days to close, if you could go out that far. Now, you don't intend to close on the property, but you've tied it up. What you want to do is turn around and sell that contract, the right to close on that property, to another investor. And then you take take a spread or you take a, a fee for that, typically, you know, five to $10,000. And that's, well, you're problem. talking about with like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, right? Yeah. So but you, you can't do problems. that. What are you talking about, Clint? You can't you do can't. that. You're right. You can't if you do it the way other uh, people uh, traditionally try to do it, to put their name down on it. But if you do it through a trust, it works like magic. You put I'll, the right the offer in the trust. The trust ties up the property with the earnest money. It has the right to close on the property. You turn around and you sell that trust to the investor. They now assume control of the trust. They close one, on the two, property. Three House Street. So that's one, two, right. three House Street puts out an offer on one, two, three House Street, and mm -hmm. that's Clint Coons right now, right? Owns it, and then Correct. and then he 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 dictates all of the parameters of the deal, right? And now what you're saying is that two weeks later. Clint finds Scott Travis and Ivan Oberon running around holding hands and, and stuff, you know, frolicking in a park somewhere and, and, and runs into them. And, and then they jump up and go, Hey, we want to buy that house. You now have the ability to sell them the trust one, two, three house street that has the house one, two, three house street in it. And Freddie may or Freddie may, uh, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, that they're none the wiser, nothing. And, and we're doing nothing illegal or wrong. Correct. That is so awesome. I mean, the fact that they were frolicking in the park holding hands is awesome, you too. Know, that was an image I wasn't going to touch. You that weren't one. prepared for, <laughs> huh? I don't think I can draw that well. Right. <laughs> no, but this uh, is awesome. Man. Oh, good. We're back to the, the, the squares. Yeah, we're back to real stuff. Hey, um, just a couple things here. If you're going to set up one of these things, uh, I, like I said, use a property address for simplicity's sake so you can always remember what's in your trust. Uh, don't list the trustee on the deed, only the trust name. You know, kind of take an asterisk by that. You definitely don't want to do any of this stuff without the without using an attorney. But there's ways that you can, if you want to be the trustee, I can set it up so your name won't appear uh, on the trust itself when we do the recording. Um, don't assign your trust interest to an LLC. This is something I'm just going to be talking about here shortly about gaining asset protection. Uh, don't do any of this this until the title has been recorded and it's complete. I run into uh, situations where my clients, I tell them A and they do B. And, it, and this comes down to the recording of the title. I say, hey, we've got their title recorded. I know you want to put that trust into an entity that provides asset protection. You're not going to do that until I tell you it's okay. And they run out and assign it over. And then they get contacted by the county. Well, the county, they assume that when you put the property into trust that you're going to be the beneficiary. This is how you, do, you avoid triggering any transfer taxes. Um, but you send them paperwork because you don't know what it is they're asking for. And you send them not only your copy of your trust, copy of the deed, and you send them a copy of the assignment, a copy of your LLC. And they get all this and they say, what did you just do? And now the cat's out of the bag. Because one of the benefits, as I stated earlier, about using land trust is that it avoids transfer taxes. Uh, down in Florida, for instance, there's a dock stamps. So whenever you transfer encumbered real estate into a business entity, you have to pay a tax. But if you transfer it into a land trust first, it avoids that task, uh, tax. One of my good friends, he's an attorney here where I live in Washington State, and uh, he tried to do some structuring for one of his clients in Florida, and it cost him a little over $2,000 because he didn't know what he was doing. And he's a real estate attorney. He just figured, hey, Florida's like everywhere else. I'll just transfer it in the LLC for asset protection. The problem was it was encumbered. And a year later, once the county caught it and they got their records up to date, they went back to the his client and said, you owe us a little over $2,000 for that transfer. 
that took place last year. So my buddy had to eat that cost because he didn't know what he was doing. He should have used a land trust. So these are things that you want to keep in mind whenever you set these up. Do not just blatantly uh, turn over documents to anybody until you've consulted with an attorney so you understand exactly what it is they're asking for. Okay. Now, uh, Eugene um, has his hand up right now. Okay. Uh, Eugene, are you having your hand up because you have a question about something that, that uh, Clint just went over? And if that's the case, um, I'm going to put your hand down. Go ahead and put it back up again, and I will unmute you so you can ask your question. Um, you can also write your question in the lower box if it's uh, something else or you can, you know, I, I we are going to have uh, the question and answer time. But I just wanted to make sure that you didn't maybe hit it by accident, that you actually had a question that was pertaining to something he was just going over. And then I will unmute you. So if that's the case, man, re-raise your hand real quick and I will get right to you. Go ahead, Clint. Okay, so... Um... Don't ever try to sign your mortgage over to the trust. They, you know, People tell me, hey, I'm going to call up my mortgage broker after this is done and tell them I want the mortgage retitled in the name of the trust. The answer to that is always going to be no. Now, why is that? Because that's always the safest answer for a bank to give you whenever you ask for permission to do anything. So just, just ignore it completely. Keep the mortgage in your own name. There's no asset protection with the trust. It's not going to relieve you of any financial liability to the bank by putting it into the trust. So there's no purpose in assigning that mortgage over. Now you, um, you keep saying there's no asset protection. So can you, can you explain that part real quick? We're talking about a land trust and there's two different things, right? There's, there's asset protection aspect of it, which is, which means what? That if somebody were to sue, then um, they can't get anything. So if here's my trust right here, has this property inside of there and you're down here as the beneficiary. So if somebody brings a lawsuit against the property, let's say it has to do with mold or whatever's in the property itself, mm -hmm. not only can they come after the trust, but they also can come after you as the beneficiary of the trust because you're, oh. you hold the beneficial interest. So you're fully liable or vice versa. Somebody sues you and you own a land trust, they can take the land trust and all of its assets from you because a land trust is considered to be personal property. Some states it's real property, but most states considered to be personal property. Either way, they get the asset. So that's what I mean. There's no asset protection with this type of um, vehicle. Okay. So we want to do both. We want to be able to, and we can do both, right? And that's one of the other things that you're going to show us how to do. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. This is baby steps. We're working our way there. We're working our way. I got you. Right, and this may be right. something where we do a few of these, man. Maybe it's not just one. Maybe it's a couple. And, and real quick before, let's say somebody's listening and going, okay, oh my God, I'm, I'm freaking out. This is awesome. If, if you guys are interested, Clint wrote a book too, and I'm just going to throw this out here real quick. If you guys go to c2crea.com forward slash free book, that's c2crea.com forward slash free book, you guys can go ahead and put in your information and, and Clint will actually sign it to you and then mail it off. It's an actual book and you will get his book for absolutely free. That's why it's free book. It's the only it's the only free book one I have. So make sure you guys go and check that out because it's an incredible book and I want to make sure you guys get it. Um, all right, go ahead. All right. So taxpayer identification number. If anybody ever asks you, they need an ID number for the trust. The trust does not need an ID number because it's a grantor trust. All you do is provide the beneficiary's ID number. So if I'm the beneficiary of the trust, I'd give my SOCH. If I have my trust that's being owned by an LLC, then I'd give them the LLC's EIN. So whenever you ask for a beneficial or for for a taxpayer identification number, always give them the beneficiary's number because um, they're the oh, ones getting paid, right? And that's that, that's important. That's where you want. Let's say it was uh, interest, and you're getting 1099. You uh, the 1099 is going to hit you, so you want to make sure you give them the the appropriate identification number, so it shows up on the right tax return. Got it. And then. Um, you only need a bank account for the trust if your LLC is not in the same state. For example, I have some people will create a land trust, for instance, in uh, Georgia, but the LLC is actually located in New Mexico. Well, in that particular case, if you don't have that LLC registered to do business in Georgia and all you have is that land trust, and this would be another topic for, for a different call, uh, in that case, you'd have to have that land trust have a bank account because the LLC, if it was to be collecting the rents on behalf of the trust, it should technically register to do business in that state. If you don't want it to register there, then have the tenants pay the trust itself and then distribute the money down to your LLC that's held in a different state. So that's just a couple little action items there. So here's how it works. Oh, man, that was awesome. 
You like that slide? Yeah, that was there awesome. Ooh, that kind of scares you, doesn't it? See how it works? Look at that. <laughs> All right, so you set up your trust. We'll call it the 732 Trust. You know, you could be the trustee, but if you want a little privacy there, you know, use a nominee trustee uh, to serve. So when you take title, it's a nominee trustee, the 732 Trust. Then you'll deed your property over into the trust. And now, as the beneficiaries, you control that property through this trust. What do you mean so by deed what, it over? Is that difficult to do? What, what does that really mean and how? what, what does that take? No, oh, it takes is one piece of paper. Well, depending on the length of your deed, it could take you know two pieces of paper. I hereby assign, transfer, and forever pledge this asset to the name of this trust. It's a grant deed. Uh, it's you know in some states, some people tell you use a quick claim deed. I would okay. avoid quick claim deeds. I would t I prefer to use warranty deeds. And the reason why is that when it comes to title insurance, it just looks better that you're using warranty deeds and not quick claim deeds. What's the difference between the two? A quick claim deed says you transfer whatever you have uh, and you're not warranting that you actually even hold good title to the property. You're just saying, oh. whatever I own in this property, it's yours. Where with a warranty deed, you're saying, yeah, I, I am fully seized of title. I own this entire property and all the rights that go with it. And I warrant that fact. So if it turns out to be untrue, you can I sue. I will take care of it. That's awesome. That's right. Yeah. Right on. I, I'm that, that was cool. Thank you, Clint. Oh, my. You're okay. Welcome. Who's that? Who's that? Well, what doesn't this thing provide? Well, as we've been talking about, it doesn't provide asset protection. So how do you get the asset protection? Well, I've been hinting about it. We've been kind of talking around the issue. It's real simple. You've got your trust. All you need to do is have an LLC that you're the members of, and then you just transfer your trust into your LLC via an assignment. And now, if anything were to happen on that property, as I stated earlier, the beneficiary of the trust is liable. Well, in this example, you're no longer the beneficiary. It's your LLC that is now the beneficiary of the trust. So the creditors would come after the trust itself, and then once they hit the trust, then they go after uh, the LLC, and so you remain insulated from from any type of harm. I actually have a client here in Washington State that is in this exact same situation where the attorney brought an action against the trust, named my client as a responsible party as the beneficiary, only later to find out he made a mistake because he assumed that my client was a beneficiary. He hadn't actually seen the trust, which stated that the LLC was a beneficiary. So he had to, he had to amend his complaint to list the LLC as another party or defendant to his particular action. So it, it works rather, I mean, it works extremely well when you're looking for asset protection and setting it up in this manner. You couple land trusts and LLCs together. I do it all the time for real estate investors. In fact, if, I, if somebody comes to me and they have encumbered property, I will always create that land trust first and then dump that land trust into the LLC. And that is really your, that, that's, your, uh, that's your protection. That's your wall of protection right there. You've got a moat in between the red and the blue, right? Correct. You're <laughs> insulated from that. Yeah. We got sharks swimming around in there. There you go with lasers. Yeah. Sharks, sharks with lasers on them. Um, <laughs> all right. I have a question for you. Uh, sure. well, uh, well, I'll wait. Wait till you get to when you're ready for a question. Go ahead and hit me. I can take a question now. Okay. I'm good. All right. Um, Shakita, I'm going to unmute you. You are good to go. Go ahead and ask your question. Hello. Yep. Hi. Hi. Okay, um, my question is, um, can you go over the wholesale trust transfer process again? You said that you would buy time um, when you're buying a HUD home and be able to wholesale it to the investor. You just said so buy can time? Can you explain how you... Yeah, didn't he say you would buy time like 90 days or 120 days for closing? Well, I didn't mean it in the sense that you actually pay cash for the time. What I'm referring to is... No, you... no. Okay. Not, I mean, not not buy it like actually with money, but, you know, like... Buy time. You're just trying to get as much time as possible is what yeah. you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah. so let's say right. that you write up right. a deal that you have 90 days to close on the property. You with me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the key here is that if you took title in your own name, 
you cannot assign that contract to someone else to close. So if you had the title in your, if you had the right to close on that property in your name, then HUD would require whoever you're buying it from this, either, you know, in this type of situation, if you're dealing with a bank, uh, they're going to require that you yourself are the ones that come to the table that pay for the property and title be taken in your name. So then what you have to do is turn around and flip it to somebody else. And so you're going to get to okay. hit with double closing costs on that type of transaction. So an easy way to do this, because let's assume you don't have the money to close on the property and you don't want to pay those double costs, is that you, would you write up your offer, you do it in the name of your trust. So you tie the property up with this trust. So it is the one that has the right to come to closing to buy the property. So that is who the seller has negotiated with, and that's who they expect. Now, you're behind the trust initially, but you can put, you can substitute yourself for an investor. And what my clients will do is they'll go out and find an investor who's willing to take title of that property. They want that property, and they'll tell them, listen, I will give you the right to buy this property for a finder's fee, basically. We don't want to say that, but we're, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you the right to, to for this trust, through the assignment of this trust, the right to close for $10,000 or $5,000, whatever you negotiate. And then you transfer the trust to the buyer, which is typically the investor, of course. And now the investor can go to the seller as the beneficiary of the trust, the newly appointed trustee and close on the transaction and get their property from whatever it is that you had originally negotiated it for. So let's say if you negotiated the sale price at 120000 you go to a, an individual investor and say, listen, I have this property here. I think with a little love and care, it could be worth $180,000. I'm willing to sell you the right to close on this for $8,000. And they say, great, I'll take okay. it. So they pay you eight grand. They go to closing with the 120. It's their property. They're into it for 128. They rehab it and they sell it for 180. And here's the other thing that you're able to do too, okay. um, is some of those programs have it where within the first 90 days or six months, you're not allowed to make over like a 15% increase in price, right? Mm -hmm. And this goes ahead and 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 um, gets around that as well, right? Correct. Correct, because you're not selling the property. What you're doing is selling the right to close on the property, and not but and and you're selling them the 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 actual land trust. So let's say that she sells me the land trust. I now I now possess the property. I can now fix the property up and resell it again within that six month time frame for double if I wanted to, as long as I keep it within that same trust. Correct. Technically, yes, because nobody's going to find out about it. See, and there you go. Wow. And that that I think is something also that would be very beneficial when you're talking to a, an investor going, look, it's already in a trust. So you get the trust with it, meaning you can go ahead and resell it and nobody's going to be saying anything. You're not going to be breaking any of those rules. And I just again, I, I think it's just an amazing way to do what we're doing. Um, and and I think that, um, you know, working with somebody like Clint to do it so that you make sure you're doing it right. Um, there's a lot of people out there that sell gum. You know what I mean? But. Okay, that was a horrible example. Never mind. I'm going to stop talking again. Um, all right, we have one. Did that answer your your question, Chiquita? Yes, thank you. You are very You're welcome. welcome. I'm going to go ahead and mute you back out, Eugene. All right, I'm going to unmute you real quick. Are you ready for your question? Eugene? Did you raise your hand by accident again? All right, I'm muting you back out, putting the hands down again, and we're good to go. Go ahead and keep going, Clint. Well, hey, that's my uh, whole take on land trust. Um, if you want, we could touch on uh, 664 trust on how to sell real estate. I don't know how long that's going to take for me to get through that. What, what do you want to do? Well, I, you know what we could do? Why don't we do a couple questions real quick and see where we're at? Because maybe that we we do one of those next time. Maybe I, I would love to have you on again. It, Let's do this. Let's do it next time. But let me just um, ask people a few questions here. Okay. So, so go ahead and touch base on what we're going to be talking about next time. 664 okay. trust. Are you just making up numbers at this point, man? Because you had like 774 on the last one. Now we've got 664. Are you going to be bringing on the 832? I'm just seeing if you're actually paying attention. Okay. I'm just, I'm just trying to figure <laughs> out what's going on, man. Okay. You know, I want to thank you for sending over that baby picture, but you know, think about it this way. <laughs> you know, what if, uh, 
what if you could sell real estate tax free and you don't have to engage in a 1031 exchange? I mean, wouldn't that be cool that to be able to get out of real estate at any time and never pay any tax on that deal? And in fact, what if you could sell that real estate, not roll into other real estate, but you could turn it into a stock market? You put it in the stock market if that's where you wanted to go. You could put it into antique cars and you want to hold those for for long term. Are you kidding me, investment. man? This sounds just like the 401k deal, where all yeah. of a sudden you like broke open a whole new world to me. Because right now, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, well, I'm talking about selling stuff and never paying tax. Yeah, I know what sale. you're saying. I know the <laughs> words that are coming out of your mouth, okay? But what I don't understand is how you're doing what you're doing. It's like, now you see me, that movie, it's your magic. Yeah, how about the liquidate your IRA completely tax-free? Whereas oh. if you want to pull money out of your IRA, you know, you're subject to that you know, ordinary income tax, or in some cases you're subject to a 10% early withdrawal penalty depending on your age. You know, there's ways that you can solve that issue and not have to pay that tax if you know how to use the appropriate trust form. Or, you know, say you're in the stock market, you've got you got this brokerage account, you want to take the appreciated positions that you're holding in Google, in Apple, and you want to turn that into real estate because you've been listening to C2C RIA for the last year and going, gosh, I really want to get into that stuff what those guys are doing down in Atlanta or wherever <laughs> they're at this month. So this month, how do I move from stocks Boston. to real estate? Where are you at now? Boston. Well, we're in Atlanta and Boston. We actually just Atlanta got um, our, our first deal in Atlanta now from, from our trip. Uh, we, we just got that one locked down. And I believe, uh, I believe we're, that should be being funded, I don't know, today or tomorrow or something. Um, and then now we're, we're building another one in uh, Boston with about four or five people out there that are just killing it. And, and we're putting together teams, man, so that we can take down this country and, and help build it. You know what I mean? Okay. So I'm sure you run it again uh, across people who really want to get into that deal, but to move into that deal, it's going to cost them 20% because they have to liquidate some stocks right. that have gains. Well, you could actually liquidate those stocks and not pay any tax and put it into real estate if you set it up the right way. And so, Man. you know, here's something else. That's actually probably where do you easy. find these pictures at, man? Man, they're my baby pictures. <laughs> they're my baby there? pictures. <laughs> Look at him just just kicking it with the with the pipe, man. I love it. Uh, so how about if you re would actually, you know, if if you sell it the right way, the government will even give you a tax deduction for selling the asset. That's what they'll do. They'll tell you, hey, guess what? Sell the asset the way we tell you to sell it, and we will give you a tax deduction after it's sold. So not only will we not pay any tax, we'll actually give you money back for selling Stop the way it, we man. do What it. are you talking yeah. about? And then you can sell, once you've invested in these assets, it's tax-free income for life. Oh you my can God. make tax-free income for life, and you can pass it all on to your future generations completely tax-free. Is that like a living trust? Is that what you're talking about? I'm not talking about a living trust. I'm talking about a 662. Yeah, that's right. 662. Trust. I got it. 662 trust. Yeah, and, and, so you're probably saying right now, where do I sign for this thing, right? Yeah, that's, that's that, that was thinking? me right there. Yes, I'm thinking that. Where do I sign? Yeah, well, they're out there. It just is you've got to know how to structure the transaction the right way. And um, it's a definitely real possibility for people. And, and now that people are starting to learn more about this particular tool, uh, you see them leaning towards structuring it in such a manner so they don't have to pay taxes. I mean, that's the biggest problem I run into, especially our tax department. People will enter into a deal, they'll do something, and then later ask for assistance rather than first seeking assistance before they go into the, the transaction. And, a, and the, a lot of the problems that people face is that the people they're getting the advice from, they don't understand what they're trying to set up, and so they don't give them the right advice. And so if, you, if you're an, a real estate investor, you should have all your ducks in a row. You should get the plan out, what it is you're going to do. Make sure you're dealing with the people who understand you and are putting, that are working in your best interest. And then you can actually make some real magic with your real estate investing if you're investing in the right areas like you're helping pe people do. And if you set it up in the right way so that the money you're bringing in from those investments is not taxable to you, you're like we talked about earlier, and you're investing through a solo 401k rather than IRS, you're not at risk of audit down the road or you're not having problems with trying to account for the income. 
So there's so many different things you can do in, the, in this planning. This is what really excites me about real estate investors is, is looking at it like a puzzle and figuring out, all right, this piece doesn't look like it's going to fit here, but I'm going to find a way to make it fit, and it's going to look right when I do it. That's why um, we're so successful at what we do at Anderson. That's so awesome, man. I, you know, we've got to get you on the radio, I think, like once a month at least, if, if you're down for doing that too. Just put you on a Tuesday show. Um, and, and there's so much information that you have. I mean, really, what, it, what I'm learning more about you and more about you is that you're the person to talk to as you're setting it up so that you, you make sure that you do it right the first time. Yeah, everybody wants a shortcut. What's the shortcut? What's the shortcut? The shortcut is doing it right the first time. That's that's the shortcut. The shortcut's not doing it wrong and going into court and the, and and this and that and losing money and you know even going back to your thing where um or we were talking. I'm sorry, we were talking to Brian Ellis and he was talking about with the self directed that you could make a mistake on a self directed IRA and you could you could be fined more than you even have in the self directed IRA. Absolutely. I mean, that's crazy to me. That's crazy to me. And so it's like, you know, I, I'm, the more I realize this, the more I'm just really grateful for Ivan, man. That's, that's uh, all I can say is that um, I just, I love that guy. And, and the fact that, you know, he, he does look out for us and he does look at these things and, you know, where I, I get kind of crazy in the head and I'm all over the place, you know, it, it's, it's Scott and Ivan and, and all of this and, and you, and it's like, you need to make sure that you have professionals and experts around you. Be good at what you do and utilize people that are good at what they do. There's other people out there. I'm sure we're going to be talking about, you know, your, your land trust kits and stuff. And, and there are other people out there that have stuff that it's, it's less expensive. But the thing is, is again, at some points you get what you pay for. And, and when it comes down to it, did a lawyer write the land trust or did some guy over here in, you know, whatever, write the land trust? And I don't care if he's done 500 land trusts. If he hasn't been to court over it, if he doesn't know law, if he can't go and defend you, that's a problem, right? I mean, if you're going to be putting millions of dollars into these trusts, I would say that you should probably have it done by a lawyer. Make sure that it's done by somebody who knows what they're doing and are doing it correctly and that somebody that could actually stand up in a court of law for you and explain what was done. Does that make sense? I hope so, man. Does that make sense to you, uh, uh, Clint? You know, you're right on on that is that I've reviewed several land trusts that people have provided me and they've set them up for certain states. And what they fail to realize is that Florida, for instance, in Hawaii, I'll just pull those two out. They have certain language that is required to be in their land trust. And the attorneys, not the attorneys, these, these pitch men who talk about land trust and sell these kits, they don't know that because they've actually never utilized their trust the way they describe it in their promotional material. Because I can tell you right away, the way they describe the trust or how they're going to be used, most of the time, try to walk that by a judge and see what's going to happen. I mean, there's things that you could do and there's things that you should do. And just because you can do it doesn't mean you should be doing it because at the end of the day, you have to, if something does unfortunately happen, you have to defend it. And trying to get all fancy and cute and utilize all these different types of parties to the trust to provide obscurity uh, where they have directors and they don't know who who's the beneficiaries are. And if you listen to these guys, it just gets to be a little absurd. A judge will never buy off on that. So there has to be some transparency there in the actual documents themselves and they have to have the appropriate provisions in there if you're looking for the protection. Because the problem you face as someone who utilizes this tool is that, remember, eight out of the 10 attorneys have never seen one of these things before. They don't understand them. So the last thing you want to do is create something that casts into doubt the validity of the transaction that you've put together because of the type of trust you're using or the types of parties you've brought into it to make all these convoluted relationships to provide yourself something that at the end of the day is merely a smokescreen and could potentially work against you in the eyes of the trier of fact. So, well, and it's, it's kind of like Ivan says, right? When Ivan talks about insurance and people talk, you know, well, I'm going to try and get the, the cheapest insurance I can get. And it's like, well, that's that's great right up until 
something happens to your property. Somebody <laughs> steals your copper. Somebody does this. Somebody steals that. And then what you're going to be caring about is getting that property paid for, returned, put back in so you can start making money again. And so it's, it's again about getting the right protection, having the right people do the, that's why we go with NRIG. NRIG was designed by, by investors. It was built by investors to, to create insurance uh, packages and, and things for investors. And again, when it comes down to what is Clint doing, the reason that we want him on here, he is investing in real estate. He is doing land trust. He is, he is involved in this process on a daily basis. He's somebody that can defend what he's talking about. So, I mean, I know I'm kind of up, up here and, and talking a lot about him for him, but I, I want you guys to really understand the effect and the reason that we are creating the things that we're creating. You know, we now have four webinars a week, Journey to Success. We've got, um, on Mondays, we've got bird dogging opportunities with Scott Travis. We've got, on Tuesdays, Experts Corner with Pete Asmus. And on Thursdays, we've got um, Ivan Oberon's Money Matters. And Clint, I think you should probably do um, an interview there too on Ivan's show on Money Matters because, I, again, all the stuff you're talking about all deals with money. I mean, man, you guys could you guys could have a little campfire and sing Kumbaya and do all <laughs> kinds of cool stuff on that Thursday show. Yeah, we'll probably get through a lot of material too. <laughs> Shut up, man. <laughs> All right, guys, do you guys, I can't even believe this. Okay. Do you guys have any questions at all before we let uh, Clint go? Um, I, I really appreciate you being on tonight, Clint. Um, real quick though, what about your land trust program? Do you have anything set up to, to talk about that? Or, or do you have a, a, a phone number or something that they could, if they want to get more information on the land trust, what could they do? Where could they, who could they email? Who could they call? They could email me directly at ccoons at alglaw.com. Uh, there you go. That's perfect. O O N S at ALG Law. And just say you're interested in the land trust program. I sell a land trust kit if that's what you want to set up. Uh, it's $750 for the land trust kit. I'm going to write it down here. Uh, and it has all the forms, everything we've been talking about. It has the land trust agreement with the clauses set up for either. Uh, those particular states that require the language be built into it. It has the assignment forms. It has the deeds that go along with it. But more importantly, when, you, when you're buying our kit, you also get help, assistance. So I have all the forms on CD, but you're going to have questions. And we will provide you 60 days of assistance on that with, for no charge. After that, we're going to charge you $35 a month. I know it's going to probably break your credit card to pay oh us that amount. Oh, my gosh. But I, I know. Horrible. See, you're already groaning. Um, We'll talk to you about your trust and, and making sure that you're doing the things right because we want to create an open line of communications with our clients. Okay, we so don't... so that's not bad. So it's seven fifty for every trust. So every time I have a deal, no, I mean, no, I'm going to pay no. seven fifty, and I could I could make a million bucks. So I mean, that's you a that's seven fifty once one time. You get all my forms. I'm Wait, not once. In the... Yeah, you know, if you want us to do the work, I'll do it for you. But the way I often re explain this to my clients is that if I've taught you how to do it the right way and I've given you the materials to do it on your own, then you're capable of handling this without my involvement. Now, you may need me if you want to do, if you want to use me as a nominee, then of course I'm going to have to be involved in it. Or you just flat out, you don't have the time to deal with it. Uh, so in those particular cases, yeah, you could use us, but I have a lot of clients who set these things up on their own after I've done the first one or two trusts for them because they saw how it's done. There's no more magic involved in it. They see how simple it can be. And they're often run on their own. I mean, that's where I want to put my clients in the situation where they don't need attorneys. Because many times what I find is that attorneys, they're the Morton salt man. They come and they screw up deals for more people than they help. I'm dealing with a client right now that's got another week left on her 1031. And the lender's attorney is trying to kill the deal on the 11th hour. That's going to cost her a ton of money. We have this conference call tomorrow. They're on the East Coast, so i got to be on it at 630 in the morning. Oh, my gosh. But yeah. That's, what does it cost for you to be a, a nominee trustee? Uh, if we're setting up the trust, that's oh, I won't charge you any more for that if we're setting up the trust, if you're paying us. Now, that's a full-service trust there, so that's going to run you $1,200 when we're doing a full-service trust. It's not the trust kit. Um, if you're doing a, if you're setting up an LLC with us and a land trust, and it's only $500, uh, to set up the trust. So, see, our pricing depends on, on the amount of work involved and how much we're uh, putting putting forth for you. And, but, and then, the, Ivan also ahead. asked, "What does the grantor do, or or what?" And the grantor does what again? The grantor is the one that deeds the property. So, for example, one of my clients in Hawaii, 
we just got done finalizing his trust for him into an LLC. So I prepared the deed for the client, drafted the trust, prepared all the transfer forms to transfer the real estate into the land trust, then turned around and transfer, assigned his land trust over to the limited liability company we'd set up for him in Hawaii. Transaction took us about 10 days to set the whole thing up and it's done. And now he has asset protection. In fact, just this morning he sent me an email. He was concerned because he, one of the things that everybody on this call should be aware of is that when you're transferring title, let's say, into a land trust, you're setting up business entities, uh, there's some groups out there that send out false notifications to you. And you need to be really careful. It appears as if it's coming from the Secretary of State or it appears as if it's coming from the county recorder's office, but it's not. You need to read the fine print. My client thought he had to send in $80 that I had missed something on the recording and it turned out that it was one of those scams where they lead you to believe something needed to be done which it didn't need to be done. All they're looking for ways to take your money. Man, see that's that's why and I've already got people asking me for your email again so I, I went ahead and I sent that out to everybody. Um, again, one more time, that's C Coons, C C O O N S at AndersonAdvisors.com. That's A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N-A-D-V-I-S-O-R-S.com. C. Coons at AndersonAdvisors.com. Make sure that you tell them that you uh, that you watch this as well um, so that you're you're making sure you're getting the right pricing and you're getting the right help. He's he's letting us uh, have two months of of um of uh, help with this. So make sure that you get that two months of help for being a coast to coast member. Um, and listening in. The other thing uh, is uh, that that Clint is a man of, of oh man, I'm going to make fun of you. I, I'm going to stop now. I, I, otherwise, I'll just keep going. So um, let's see. What else? Thanks, Pete. You're welcome, Kenneth. Um, and let's see. I think I got everything else. The book again, guys, one more time is c2crea.com forward slash free book. I went ahead and sent that out to all of you guys on here too. So you guys all have his email now and you all have his, his uh, book link if you were on this webinar live. Now, make sure that you guys get on these webinars live because I'm going to tell you, Clint's going to end up being on Ivan Oberon's Money Matters. I already see that happening. Um, we're going to cross-platform and cross-promote. And, you know, all of us bring a different a different style. And, and Ivan's questions are going to be much different than mine. Um, and so I, I implore you guys to, to check it all out. With that, guys, thank you so much. Clint, thank you so much. And uh, have a great night. Hey, thanks for having me on. It was All pleasure. right, man. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Bye, guys.